right, good morning, church. Good morning, church. Uh, I want to just take a second before we start and praise God because I had to tell first service, uh, like, I am not feeling good, and I wasn't sure if I was going to make it through, and I feel way better already, so praise God for that. I'm super excited for what we have to talk about today. Um, if you're a regular here, you might notice that it's a little bit emptier than normal in the auditorium, and to that, I say hello to anyone tuning in from Pinecrest. We've got a whole lot of people out at the Pinecrest Family Retreat, so we hope you guys are having a ton of fun out there. Anybody that's watching online and is new to the church, we welcome you as well. And if you're new to, the, new to the church and you're in here today, then I want to invite you to go down to our connections desk. Uh, you can go down the stairs out here in the lobby, go to the welcome desk, and they'll have a free gift for you. We'd love to connect with you. If you are regular, you might also know that we are going through our series on Acts. And last week, Adam, our lead pastor, he had to jump ahead a little bit. So today we're going to rewind it back to Acts 5 verse 1. That'll be where we're at for the majority of our time today, Acts 5, verse 1. And before we start, I want to uh, seriously note something. Because until studying for this, I didn't realize how divisive the passage we're going to go through today can really be. Um, it was kind of new to me, but I think it's the implications of the passage that can sometimes be pretty divisive. It can ruffle a few feathers. And uh, if it's not the implications, then I'm willing to admit you may just uh, be upset today and disagree with how I understand it. So uh, in my study, I found a lot of fiery, combative. Uh, there, there are definitely two sides of this argument, and a lot of people on both sides will be mad if you don't end up on their side. So I pray today for a lot of grace, that we would have grace with one another, uh, that we would put all of this in the right buckets. Uh, this would be probably a conviction uh, when we get to that point, and I'll note it when we get to that point in the sermon. But uh, I'm really excited to get into it, and, and we just have grace with one another when, when we get to that section. So Acts 5, verse 1, that's where we'll spend the majority of our time today. But if you have your Bible and you're opening it up, you can actually go to Acts 1, because Acts is what we call a narrative. And there are tons of different styles and genres in the Bible of writing, like the poetry of Psalms. We have the wisdom literature of Proverbs or Ecclesiastes the epistles or letters like Romans and Ephesians and a handful of other genres. Then there are the narratives like Acts, and those are the stories. Those are generally the ones that we latch on to the most. It's the ones we remember because generally those are the stories that we can understand really easily. They just say what happened. They just tell it like it is. Here's what we saw. And so, so I think we've gotten about far enough into our study in Acts that it might be helpful to kind of do a refresher. So we're going to start in one and kind of work our way all the way back up to five. Just bird's eye view, really brief recap. If you've ever seen a TV show where they, uh, you get to the important episode and they do like a previously on and let you know everything that got you there, we're going to do that really quick. So we're going to breeze through it, starting in verse one, previously on Acts. In my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach. All right, now let's pause. Uh, we're one verse in, and I'm already pausing, so if you have lunch plans, you might want to back those up. But he says, in my first book, I told you, Theophilus, about everything Jesus began to do and teach. And that's important because, as Adam noted at the beginning of this series, that lets us know two things. One, why the book was written, and two, who wrote it. So we can confidently say that the author of Acts is Luke, because if we look at Luke 1.3, we see, having carefully investigated everything from the beginning— I also have decided to write an accurate account for you, most honorable Theophilus, so you can be certain of the truth of everything you were taught. So Acts really opens up with Luke calling back to what he wrote before to Theophilus, why he wrote the Gospel of Luke, which is also the core of Acts. It is the central message of Acts, which is Theophilus. I've been looking into this Jesus stuff too. We know from, from that last passage that Theophilus has been looking into Jesus. Luke says, I've been looking into it too. Uh, so I got these sources. I know it's hard to believe. So I got these sources. I put it all in order for you because I really want you to understand. Now, my first book was all about who Jesus was and what he did. I'm writing to you now to tell you what happened after. And that's exactly how the apostles react after Jesus leaves. Jesus rises into heaven, Acts 1, verse 10. As they strained to see him rising into heaven, two white-robed men suddenly stood among them. So you can imagine Jesus rising into heaven, and they're straining to see him. He has gotten far enough away that he is 
a dot in the sky now. They're like squinting their eyes, trying their best to still see him. These two men in white robes come and they say, men of Galilee, why are you standing here staring into heaven? Jesus has been taken from you into heaven, but someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. So these two men, traditionally thought to be angels, they come and they tell them as they still have their heads up to the sky, they haven't even looked down yet. They say, what are you guys standing around for? We got to go to work. And it's truly one of my favorite moments in scripture because it is the moment that Jesus leaves, the moment that Jesus leaves the church is in motion. Before they even have time to bring their heads down, the ball is rolling. So that's the beginning of Acts. Now let's speed it up. First step, we've got to replace Judas. He is super dead. So they gather together about 120 people. They cast lots. They flip a coin. Matthias joins the 12 apostles, and the church leadership is back to full strength. Chapter 2. Jesus talked about the kingdom of God coming in power once he left. This is that. They're gathered together again. Heaven opens up. The whole building shakes. Bada bing, bada boom. Holy Spirit is officially on the scene. All the neighbors start running in. Everyone surrounding the building is like, holy cow, what happened? Did a, did a bomb go off? And they say, no, bada bing, bada boom, we just got the Holy Spirit. Uh, except that the people listening are like, oh my goodness, I didn't know you could speak Sumerian. And then the whole church is like, oh my goodness, I didn't know I could speak Sumerian. And then everybody who heard them is like, oh my goodness, you guys are drunk. And they say, no, Jesus left already. We just have water now. Don't let that go over your head. Yeah, you got it, you got it. Peter stands up and says, haven't you guys been paying attention? Joel told us this was going to happen almost 400 years ago. So he reads the prophecy from Joel. Everybody there starts thinking, huh, he might be on to something. Then Peter says, you know, God liked Jesus because he did tons of miracles. He couldn't have done miracles if, if he weren't good with God. Uh, these people walking around that are now here, they've walked around Jerusalem. They likely saw at least one or two of Jesus's miracles uh, because he did tons of miracles. Uh, he, plus he rose from the dead and King David told us that, he was, that this was going to happen in Psalms. So he goes on, reads the Psalms, opens their eyes up to the prophecies in Scripture, and they say, brothers, what should we do? Brothers, what should we do? They say, I want in. They accept the gospel. They add 300 people, 3,000 people that day that are saved and baptized. And here's where it starts to get really cool and what's going to be even more helpful for us today. Verse 42 all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. So the church is already becoming close. The church is still in its infancy. It is brand new. It's growing like crazy. The Holy Spirit is now on the scene, and they are over 3,000 strong. And remember, this is only chapter 2. So they are tight-knit. They are tight-knit. They're all radically taking care of one another. And some even start to sell their property to help those in need. Chapter 3. Peter and John are walking to a prayer service at the temple. There's a man outside who was born without the ability to walk asking for money. And Peter says to him, I don't have money, but I can give you what I do have. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, get up and walk. The man gets up, and for the first time in his entire life, he begins to walk. He starts jumping up and down, dancing, causing a scene, praising God at the top of his lungs because he can hardly believe what just happened. He's hugging Peter and John and a crowd start to come around because they've seen this man for years and years and years sitting outside. They understand that this couldn't have been faked. For years and years and years, he has not been able to walk and now he can. This must be from God. So Peter takes that opportunity and he kind of gathers the crowd and begins to speak to them, telling them all about the prophets and Jesus, about how they were able to perform this miracle. He explains to them how Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Moses, and Samuel were all leading up to Jesus. He says that we killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. So chapter four, naturally, when you preach the exact thing that the religious leaders told you not to preach directly in front of their doorstep, they're going to get upset. So they try to shut everything down. Religious leaders come out to the crowd, try to shoo everybody away, and that actually totally backfires. They end up putting Peter and John in jail for the night, but that only burns the flame hotter. They had 5,000 more people to the church that day. So the next day, the religious leaders are furious. They're even angrier now than they were before. The high priest is there. They gather Peter and John, and they say, what makes you think you have the right to say any of this? And especially at our temple of all places. But Peter just got the Holy Spirit, so he's pumped up, and he says, we're being questioned because a lame man can walk now? 
You're mad because a lame man can walk now. You know how he was healed, and you know by whose authority we did it under. You just don't like it. We come in the authority of the man that you crucified. Jesus Christ is Lord, and he is alive. They are foaming at the mouth. But the lame man was literally standing. They brought him in, literally standing directly in front of them. They had to do something, but so many people witnessed the miracle the day before that they couldn't. They were afraid a riot would ensue. So they tell Peter and John, get out, but shut up about the Jesus stuff. Peter says, absolutely not. And they go on their way. Once they get home, the church gathers together. Peter and John tell them all about what happened. The church prays and the Holy Spirit pours over them again. Lastly, for our recap today, chapter four, verse 32, all the believers were united in heart and mind and they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. There were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. For instance, there was Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, he sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. And this is where our story begins today. So up to this point, the church has just had win after win. The church has been on the up and up. The Holy Spirit comes. They add 3,000. They get super close with one another. They are truly, really caring for one another. Peter heals the lame man. They add another 5,000. The religious leaders don't know what to do. The church is growing like crazy. They get bigger and even closer than they were before. It's growing, it's moving, the Holy Spirit is at work, they are on a mission, the church is alive, but, and that's where we start our passage today, but there was a certain man named Ananias who with his wife Sapphira sold some property. And in that first sentence, we already kind of get the gist of where this is gonna go. I love Luke, he's one of my favorite biblical authors for this reason because he gives you four chapters on how great everything's going, and then you just start with, but then it goes sideways. But there was a name named Ananias with his wife, Sapphira, sold some property. You can imagine being Theophilus at this point, reading that line on the other end of this letter, thinking, holy cow, what's going to happen? Continue. He brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Bad idea. It's important to note here that both Ananias and his wife Sapphira were in on it. Uh, we get that from this text. Ananias gets his wife's consent. Other versions translate that as simply knowledge, just that he had that she had the knowledge of what he was wanting to do. But at the very least, they have communicated about this. They are in cahoots together. They are both down to execute this plan. So we get to verse three. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? Did you catch that? Because we didn't skip a verse there. Peter knows what's going on before anybody tells him. He knows that Ananias is lying the second they get the money. No one had to tell Peter. He knows the truth. He goes on, you lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept some of the money for yourself. Imagine being Ananias in that moment, thinking like, how can you possibly know? How could you possibly know what we did? Holy Spirit tells Peter the truth, and he knows. The property was yours to sell or not to sell, he says to Ananias, as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. Peter makes it clear to Ananias, the money wasn't actually the problem here. The church was in this incredible state where everyone was willing to give up what they had and willing to give their money to the church. They were all caring for another, one another radically, everyone selling their possessions, because those people wanted to. Peter's telling Ananias, like, this was not an expectation. You did not have to do this. We look naturally back at Barnabas, who comes verses before, and we know what ends up becoming of Barnabas. We know the, the kind of hero story he ends up having. We think back to him. He sold his land because he wanted to, and he gave the money because he understood how much Christ had given for us. So Peter's telling Ananias, this property was his. It was not mandated to sell it for the church. And not only was it not mandated to sell it, certainly no one was telling him you had to sell all of it. And then he says, after you sold it to Ananias, you not only didn't have to give any money away, you didn't have to give any money away. No one said you had to give all of the money away. Just as if you or I sold any property we have, if you gave 10% to the church, I think Adam would be super, super happy about that. 
anyone would be ecstatic that you donated to the church, whether that's 10% or 20% or 30 or 50 or 100. All of those are great, generous gifts. And he's telling him, this was yours to do with what you pleased, and you chose to lie with it. There's no one else to blame. This was never an expectation. No one was twisting your arm. And then he asks, genuinely asks, how could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. And in that last verse lies the real problem. This wasn't just a lie to Peter and the apostles, although certainly lying to Peter was wrong. He says this, you're not just lying to me, you're lying to God. And I think that's twofold, because on one hand, he's raising the bar for Ananias and for us by saying that any lie is also a lie to God. God knows our hearts. God knows every thought you think. God knows every thought you hope nobody ever knows you think. Every lie we say is a lie to God. But he's also saying that in the context of where the church is at right now, the severity of this lie, the, the culture that you could ruin right now, that is bigger than just you or me. You are lying in a pivotal moment in God's church. So I've got a little story for you guys. Uh, back when I was six years old, so like five years ago, um, and I'm six years old, and I'm sitting with my older sister in her bedroom. So she would be 10 at the time. We're sitting in her bedroom, and she has this little box with all of her trinkets in it. And she pulls it out and shows me all these like little things that she just thought was neat. And one of them is a Build-A-Bear heart. Raise your hand if you've ever been to Build-A-Bear. All right, cool. Keep your hands up. Everybody else, these, uh, take note. These are all the crazy people that'll pay $50 for a teddy bear with a t-shirt on it. Uh, so yeah, if you're, the lunch plans, if they're already changing, go ahead and not invite them. But you know how I turned out. So my parents are crazy. I go to Build-A-Bear workshop. I see this little heart that my sister has. And I just like hyper fixate on this thing, which if you know me, I don't do that. But in this case, I like hyper fixate on this little heart. For the next week, it's all I can talk about. I'm going to school, telling my friends about how cool this thing is. And if you haven't seen one of these things, we're talking like probably less than two cents worth of like cloth and like fluff stuffed in it. But I like, I want this thing so, so bad. I asked my sister, she obviously says no. So like next week, it's all I can think about. And we end up going to the mall just my dad, my sister, and I, we all go to the mall together. And I kind of imagine my dad at, at some point was just hearing me and my sister ask, like, hey, can we go to Build-A-Bear Workshop? And he said, absolutely not. We don't have money. And then we go to the next shop. We go, hey, dad, can we go to Build-A-Bear Workshop? He goes, absolutely not. We don't have money. And we just keep asking, keep asking. And eventually he's like, hey, if you guys will just like stop talking, uh, I'll take you. But we are not buying anything. It was very clear. We are not buying anything. And you're not going to talk me out of it. We can go look. And me and my sister, we know my dad. So we're like, yeah, that's probably a pretty good deal. We're happy to just go get to look. So we go to Build-A-Bear Workshop. And this is where my brilliant six-year-old mind comes up with a devious little plan. I'm like, I'm going to steal a Build-A-Bear Workshop heart. Because I think my six-year-old brain didn't understand. You can probably just ask for it. But I'm like set. I'm going to steal it. I'm going to Indiana Jones this thing. It's going to be awesome. So... Yeah, you can, this is the visual I have in my head. I need you to understand, I, I don't even understand how myself, how clearly I remember this scene in my head. It is, I, I, <laughs> this moment is so crystal clear in my head. There's a wall right here of all the bears and all the t-shirts and everything you're looking at. And over where you guys are at is like the machine that puts the fluff in the bears and when you put the heart in. And so I'm like facing these teddy bears with my sister. We're looking and I just keep doing this guy. Like side eyeing, all right, once there's an opening, I'm going to go. I see an opening, drop the teddy bear, sprint across the Build-A-Bear workshop, take a heart out of this huge tub. And I remember looking up to my left and seeing the woman that's running the machine just kind of look down at me. And in my head, I'm like, I'm so fast, she can't even see me. And in reality, she's probably like, why are you just running around like a crazy person? And I steal the heart, throw it in my back pocket, run to my sister. And then I just put my hands behind my back and I'm like, yeah, I didn't do anything. We're good to go if you want. And so a few stores later, I, I remember this again, way better than I probably should. My dad is tying his shoe and I go over to my sister. I pull out the heart and I'm like, look what I got from Build-A-Bear. And she immediately tattles on me. She goes and tells my dad, hey, Will stole the, oh, my real name's Will. I didn't shoot. I just outed myself. She says, Will, uh, he stole a Build-A-Bear heart. And I, uh, I start bawling my eyes out immediately. My dad walks over to me and in like, 
an incredibly, incredibly impressive moment of parenting. My dad just kneels down to me and he's like, can you show me what you have? And I pull out the heart, just tears pouring down my face. And he's like, we're gonna need to go give that back. And I'm like, yes, all right, okay. And so we walk all the way back to Build-A-Bear Workshop. And I remember he goes in, I'm just like standing out in the hallway, bawling my eyes out. My dad goes in and brings an employee out. And in my head, that employee was like seven feet tall giant. I'm just looking up at him, um, like this Goliath in front of me. In reality, he's probably like a 16 year old getting paid minimum wage. And he walks out and there's just this crying kid. And my dad pats me on the back and he's like, all right, tell him what you did. And so I give him the heart back. I'm crying my eyes out. Like, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. I just wanted it real bad. And then he, the 16 year old just takes it from me. And I'm sure he's super confused about what's happening right now. Takes the heart goes back inside, and then my dad turns around and he gives me a hug. And he explains to me why you can't just steal something because you want it. And I'm sure that I have stolen in some other way since then, uh, because I think we steal in a lot of different ways. But I've never like shoplifted again since that day. That was a pretty formative moment for me. My dad turning around and handling it so well, explaining why you can't just take something because you want it. Um, And it was just a -a Build-A-Bear heart. But the reason I tell that story is because obviously the heart was not actually the issue there, right? Nobody was like really worried about the value of Build-A-Bear, like the stock's gonna plummet because the six-year-old took this little heart. It wasn't the issue, the the real issue was my heart. See what I did there? The real issue is like, it's going to affect my integrity. Going forward, it's going to affect how I treat others. It's gonna affect my relationship with God. And my dad understood that. So for Ananias and Sapphira, What happens to them in this circumstance? In the same way that I was disciplined by my father, how does the Lord discipline them? What's the proverbial bring it back to build a bear for them? When we get to verse five, as soon as Ananias heard those words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet and took him out and buried him. And as for Sapphira, about three hours later, his wife came in not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, what was this the price you and your husband received for your land? And I need you to understand those words correctly right there, because the incredible grace that Peter is showing Sapphira in that moment to give her a chance to turn back and make it right, fess up, tell the truth. He gives her this incredible grace. I would imagine he, he's probably angry himself. And if you imagine what he has just seen, three hours earlier, he sees a man drop dead in front of him. He certainly does not want to see that happen again to Sapphira, even just for his own benefit. I wouldn't want to see that. And so he gives her this chance. Was this the price you received for your land? Yes, she replied, that was the price. And at that moment, her fate was sealed. Had she confessed and said, no, it was not the price. We lied and I'm sorry. I've sinned against you and God. I am certain that God would have forgiven her. But that's not the way that this went. Verse nine, and Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are just outside the door and they will carry you out too. Again, the Holy Spirit gives this insight into what's about to unfold before probably anybody else, including Sapphira, knew it. He simply tells her the truth. Your husband is dead and so are you. Instantly, she fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And our final verse for today, 11, great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who had heard what happened. So you understand why I spoke earlier about this passage being a little bit difficult, why it can become a little bit divisive, why it is uncomfortable. And we're going to talk through that now. This is a hard passage. But the two most common problems or issues I see with this passage is one, did God kill them? And two, are they believers? Those are the two things that as you look into this passage, people very passionately argue about these two things. And at face value, they don't seem like big deals. I'm sure there are some of us in the room who are like, it's totally easy to reconcile the God of the gospels with this God. But there are others in the room who this may be a huge, almost insurmountable theological hurdle. This might feel really, really big. I bet there are people in this room who hold one, if not both, of these points of view. 
that it was not God who killed them and that they must have been unbelievers. The issue is, and that at risk of upsetting anyone in the room today, please know my heart, those changes actually really do affect what we should take from this passage. They really do affect what this should teach us. They affect how we see the wrath and mercy of God, how we see the love and the justice of God. So let's start first with, did God kill them? It may make some of us uncomfortable, but the answer is clearly yes. Based on Sapphira, we can presume that the Holy Spirit told Peter what was going to happen to Ananias as well. This is why Peter explains to Ananias almost frantically, Ananias, you did not have to do this. The Holy Spirit has likely told him already what's about to happen, and Ananias has no idea. You did not have to do this. No one expected this of you. You didn't have to sell your home. You didn't have to give the money. He understands before Ananias that Ananias will die for this sin. And we can imagine that that's going to shock Peter. It would certainly shock any of us. I heard quite a few theologians go as far as to say that both Ananias and Sapphira must have died of heart attacks as a way of avoiding the uncomfortableness of if God killed them. It must have been some natural thing that they were just so burdened by the weight of their sin that they both had heart attacks. But it's simply not in the text. I read a lot of comments from Christians furious that someone might insinuate that God would have killed believers. But the way that Peter speaks is clearly from what the Holy Spirit has told him. They sinned against God, they sinned against the Holy Spirit, and then they die. That's actually a, a good view of the Trinity there. You lie to the Holy Spirit, you sinned against God, and then they die. Many people online were blaming Peter, saying that Peter spoke a word of condemnation on them, which... I mean, if you think about it, that has to be kind of silly because no apostle, no one other than Jesus ever had the ability to heal or condemn anybody of their own right. Any miracle anybody would ever be, would ever be doing is not of their own will, and it's certainly not against the will of God. So then people come to the conclusion that, okay, well, then they must not have been believers. I heard a pastor stubbornly say that if they were believers, they must have renounced their faith with that sin, with the sin of lying to the Holy Spirit. They must have un ren un renounced their faith. And that opened up a whole can of worms of theological issues. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. So the conclusions that they were not believers, I just humbly say, I don't know. I will not strongly say they are, but we cannot strongly say they are not. We simply don't know. The strongest argument that they are not is in verse 3, when Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? Because if they are true believers, then we know that Satan has no power on us. So if, if that's what Peter is saying, then clearly they were not believers. But it could also just simply mean that they allowed Satan to influence their heart, which I'm more inclined to believe. Apart from this, the only information we have is that they were early church followers and they believed it enough to give a huge sum of money to the church. And we know it's a large sum of money because the Bible tells us that they kept some. It doesn't tell us how much, but it, they had given enough to the church that they thought this would pass as the whole price. They had given enough that they thought when we go to the apostles and say this was the cost of our entire land that they would believe it. So it couldn't, it's not 5% of the land this was a large sum of money. And the real point I want to make through this, and I really hope it stretches some of us this morning, is that God is always just, not just when we think he is. God is always just, not just when we think he is. And God is absolutely just to discipline us when we sin against him. The Bible not only says that God will discipline us, it actually tells us that it is a problem as a believer if you are not being disciplined. Hebrews 12, 7 through 8, endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? Exactly how I was disciplined by my father. If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not a legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. So God never says that because we're in the new covenant, we will now not face discipline. He actually says that discipline is a sort of litmus test for whether or not we are believers. And parents, y'all are going to love this one. You could, I imagine this on like one of those nice wooden plaques above the dining room table. Proverbs 12, 1, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. You can give that one to your kids. 
Whoever hates correction is stupid. There are even specific scriptures, such as 1 Corinthians 11.30, that say some Christians have died due to an abuse of communion. Not that they've lost their faith, nothing can separate us from the love of God again, but that God took him home early. But yet, verse 32, right after it, says this. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So that we won't be disciplined, so that we won't be condemned along with the world. Scripture tells us that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but it does not tell us there is no discipline for those who are in Christ Jesus. So could God, could he have disciplined Ananias and Sapphira with death so that they would not fall into condemnation with the world? Could the Lord have ended their earthly lives in order to protect the integrity and the culture of his infant church? I believe scripture's answer is yes. And how beautiful would that grace be? Did he? I don't know. But could he? Would God be wrong to do so? Would God be wrong to save you or I before we end ourselves? Absolutely not. And as we come to a close this morning, above all else, I want us to wrestle with this. When we look at the story of Ananias and Sapphira and we feel that God treated them harshly, we have to understand first what was at stake. The church is brand new and it is doing really well. This is God not only protecting his flock from the inside. This is God shooting a beacon out to the world, telling him that he is going to fiercely protect his church. Why else would great fear have gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened? It was because this was also a signal that God is going to protect us. Th the church this was kind of the first time they were truly met with the fear of God and the holiness of God and the justice of God. And it terrified them. When we look at the story of Ananias and Sapphira and feel that God treated them harshly, we need to remember that they are not the outliers because God struck them down. We are the outliers that God has not struck us down. That's what we deserved. We look at this story and we see the life that they paid for their sins. And church, stay with me. Hear this. We look at the story and we see the life that they had to pay for their sins, but we forget about the life that was paid for our sins. We didn't get off scot-free. Someone else took the punishment. There was still a life paid for our sins. When we lie, we deserve to die. When we steal, we deserve to to die. Sit in our sin for a second and feel that. God is holy and just and perfect. He has done everything for us, and yet we still walk away. We stare in the face of God Almighty, and we say, I know better. This story is a reminder that we are not as good as we think we are. God hates sin. He doesn't not like sin. He doesn't just prefer if we don't do it. God hates sin. He hated it so much that he put himself on a cross, took our place, Jesus Christ pierced for our iniquities, and his father had to turn away from him. God wasn't cruel to Ananias and Sapphira. They got what we all deserve. And praise God that we did it. Praise God that he has set me free because church, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Christ didn't come because we deserve it. He came in spite of the fact that we could never deserve it. It's a gift. And if you've never accepted that gift before, I pray that today would be that day. If you have accepted that gift, then take today as a reminder and praise God. We never outgrow the gospel. We never grow out of needing to hear the love of Christ. I read this passage this week where, where Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane before he's betrayed, and he prays for all future believers, which means he was praying for you. He was praying for me. He had your name in mind because he knows your name. Jesus kneels down and he prays for each and every one of us. Jesus, our Lord and our God.
God Almighty who lowered himself to be like us, who gave himself up for us, just to show you how much he loves you, to make us right with him. While we were still sinners, while we were still sinners, before we'd taken a single step towards him, God gave himself up for us. Christ died for us. And so I pray if you've never accepted that gift, that today we open up that wrapping paper. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He truly, really loves you. And in this life, I don't think we can ever fully grasp the weight of our sin, but praise God that we don't have to. Because I think we also can't grasp the weight of God's love for us. Jesus paid it all. All we have to do is thank him and accept it. Pray with me. Dear Lord, thank you so much for everything you've done for us, God, for the unbelievable price that you have paid for us, that while we could never deserve it, while we could never earn it, we could never be good enough, God, you don't expect us to be. You give yourself up freely to pay for our sins, to pay for our wrongs. God, thank you. Thank you for protecting your church, that we could be here today and continue praising you, that we could be here today, continue loving you, continue serving others for you. God, thank you for protecting your church. Thank you for saving us. And I pray that today, if there's anyone who does not know you, they would walk out of this building knowing you. Thank you, God, for all you do and for all you are. In Jesus' name, amen.